Good evening and welcome. I'm Jean Johnson, one of the librarians at Stanford Health Library. Thank you for joining us at tonight's talk, Understanding Myalgic Encephalomyelitis, Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, and Long COVID. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Hector Bonilla. Dr. Bonilla is a clinical associate professor of infectious disease at Stanford Medicine. His experience treating HIV, HCV, combined with his interest in inflammatory response, is the driving force behind his desire to understand MECFS. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, he has been an investigator in several outpatient clinical trials and long-term post-COVID follow-up studies. Dr. Bonilla is currently the co-director of Stanford Healthcare's Long COVID Clinic. The clinic follows more than 800 patients with post-COVID symptoms and participates in several long COVID studies. He's a member of several subcommittees of the Recover Initiative, which was created by NIH to study the long-term effects of COVID-19. His patients are his inspiration and he is committed to continuing research to seek answers to their health challenges. Doctor, I'll turn it over to you. So, good night. It's a pleasure uh, to be here, and thank you for the uh, invitation for this kind of lecture. And I want to be thanks to the university, Stanford Healthcare, and the uh, for support uh, the clinic on, on those programs, as well as philanthropy to support our uh, uh, clinical research. Uh, today, I want to just share with you my intake about uh, these uh, two conditions. Uh, MECFS and long COVID symptoms. So um, let me want to share my. So I want to just this uh, work had been a, a work of, of multiple people collaborating in this kind of studies, a multidisciplinary clinical clinic with a research and and network of collaborations. I want to thank my immediate collaborator, Dr. Uh, Linda Gein. Uh, Dr. Robert Schaefer and uh, our PAs in the clinic, as well as the work collaborator for the autonomic clinic, Dr. Mish Miklis, Dr. Fritz Jan for cardiology, and Dr. Orlin Sumpin for sleep medicine, as well as our students, as well as uh, many consultants that have been helped to build all this kind of clinic, as well as collaborators in research, Dr. Opi Pinder Singh, and um, Dr. Uh, Pras Jonathan, and Dr. Mark Davis and Sharon Champion and Recover. The objectives of this presentation is try to have the definitions on epidemiology, MECFS, as well as long COVID, the model for the illness, the inflammatory uh, inflammation as well as mitochondrial dysfunctions, and the definition for long COVID, the model of the, this illness, and when the link in between the uh, long COVID and MECFS. So the diagnosis of chronic fatigue has been based only on clinical criteria because so far we don't have no uh, biomarker, clinical biomarker or metabolic or, or biomarker for this kind of conditions. So the diagnosis has based in, in different clinical criteria and the most common or recognized criteria are the CDC of Akura criteria the, that establish a, a chronic fatigue after have a extensive exclusion other illness and the symptoms persist for more than six months. The Canadian consensus criteria they outline the post malaise and the pain and, and symptoms persist for longer than six months. And the more recently in 2015, the Institute of Medicine or IOM criteria. So in this in this kind of um a criteria they propose five different kind of diagnosis or symptoms. One is based on uh, fatigue. The fatigue has been severe and incapacitated that interfere with the people's personal, social, educational, or professional life. And those symptoms of fatigue persist for longer than six months. The post exceptional malaise, defined by exacerbations of the symptoms after physical activity, stress, or stimulations. The, the unrefreshing sleep or no reparatory sleep People can sleep for hours 
and they wake up like that. They didn't sleep at all. And they are either one of those uh, follow criteria or one of the follow criteria. One is the cognitive impairment or brain fog that the people uh, know this kind of symptoms in this way or present the orthostatic intolerance. Patient, when they're standing up, they feel dizzy and sometimes people uh, develop some syncope episodes. So the uh, MECF have, have been show effect around 2.5 million of people in the United States, predominantly and females, and with the age uh, around 33 years old, but range from 10 to 77, and the symptoms can persist for years and even decades. The economical impact, uh, impact of this disease for the society have been estimated over $24 billion. More recently, the CDC uh, developed a survey between 2021-2022 on um, 57,000 participants. They tried to look, look at the prevalence of MECFS in, in this population. They found 1.3% of the population have um, MECSF, but this survey and predominant white females, 1.7% versus 0 0.9, around 60 to 70 percent of the female population have been affected by these kind of conditions. The second thing they're looking for, the distribution according to the age, and they found out the age between 50 to 70 are the age have been more affected, but a low, lower in the stream of, of, of the life, a younger than 18 and older than 70. And the distribution and different kind of ethnicity, and they found the white non-Hispanic as affected more than the rest of the population, followed by Hispanic black, non-Hispanic blacks, and Hispanic population. So the our model in, in our clinic, how to approach this problem is this chronic fatigue syndrome is a neuroinflammatory condition, inflammation and the brain have been affected with this illness. And I'm going to just bring to you based on research, mainly that here in Stanford, that we can uh, conclude what is a chronic fatigue syndrome as a whole, or we can uh, 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 figure out or, uh, this condition as a neuroinflammatory disease. So the first study was a study on cytokines. Cytokines are proteins than we have in the blood, and this is the language of the immune system. Those cytokines direct the immune system to perform one function, one other one. And there are many studies in cytokines, but the, the two biggest studies in cytokines came from uh, the Canadians, uh, Landy, that used uh, 34 cytokines in 100 patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and 79 controls. And they found some cytokines having high levels and sometimes low levels. Like in this case, they found IL-16, IL-7, BGF-alpha, low levels, an increase of CCL-24. In a subsequent study, biggest study here in Stanford, uh, done by Montoya and collaborators, that measured more cytokines, 51 cytokines, the volume of patients increased from 192 participants, 399 controls, and they found a significant high levels in 17 of the 51 cytokines and its correlation between the changes in cytokine and severity of the illness. But they found out two cytokines are, uh, stand out from this study. One, resistant was at low levels and TGS beta was in higher uh, levels. The, que the question is why this variability? Why different studies doesn't agree in how the same cytokines the, for me, this explanation came from a study done from a year younger that showed the variability in the cytokines. And this study include 10 females with chronic fatigue syndrome and 10 females as a control. They draw blood every day for 25 days and measure 51 cytokines, and they focus in leptin. So uh, in here, in this kind of uh, graph, is we see uh, the 10 patients, and in green represent the cytokine leptin. And you see the cytokine leptin sometimes up, sometimes down, a lot of variability all the time in all the patients. But they ask a very 
important and simple, simple question to the patients. Tell us about the fatigue. And they found a straight correlation between cytokine levels and the degree of fatigue. So this study uh, a, tell, telling us directly or indirect, directly or indirectly, the cytokines are the drivers of the symptoms in chronic fatigue syndrome. So modifications or inflammation or modifications on cytokines will be one of the ways we can approach these kind of conditions. The, in, the studies in cytokines and spinal fluid, they again show in the patient with chronic fatigue, they have a low levels of IL-10. So it implies there's a different responses in the brain. So how we can determine cytokine inflammations in the brain, uh, because in the spinal fluid doesn't mean what happened in the brain tissue. So, um, but, uh, and what happened with the changes in the activities. So uh, this uh, I study looking for the impact of exercise on cytokine levels, and they found out the uh, exercise can induce inflammatory response. In this study, uh, of 24 patients with chronic fatigue uh, syndrome, a match with a 24 sedentary control, measured 51 cytokines, and followed by exercise, and they found 10 cytokines changed between the two groups. A increase and two decrease, but the changes in the cytokines from the same activity between the controls and the patient were a different cytokine profile. Like I indicate, exercise can induce inflammatory responses. In this kind of graphic, we see the connectivity of the different kind of cytokines. In, in blue, we see low levels of cytokines. In red, high levels of cytokines. The small circles means small changes, big circles, big changes. And we see the connectivity of the red dots compared to connectivity of the red dots in the controls are completely different. So maybe this kind of cytokine profiles may help us to make a, a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome complete with a healthy population. So uh, when you're talking about the brain and inflammation, we need to uh, study about the cells that are implied in, implicated in the inflammation is the microglial cells. The glial cells in general, they are around 10 to 15 times they outnumber the neurons. So the, the role of the glial cells is very important to maintain the brain function. And there are three major populations of, of glial cells, the astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and the microglial cells. And the microglial cells are the inflammatory cells that is going to mediate all the immune responses in the brain. So these cells uh, have been a uh, represent around five to twenty percent of the non-neuronal glial cells in the brain. They are macrophages that live into the brain. They don't leave the brain, but they can be influenced by uh, different factors like inflammatory cytokines. They maintain the homeostasis in the brain, try to maintain the brain clean, removing all the debris. And it's very plastic and dynamic cell because they can go from homeostatic to be reactive state. And they, according to the stimuli or the cytokine presented to them, is going to have a different kind of uh, functions. They can be regulated by specific markers of the cells, uh, can be called out. Uh, behave as a phagocytic cells, and that can behave as anti presenter cells, is multifunctional cells. So, so, so the way to, how we can study the inflammation in the brain. Uh, this, um, uh, the way to study inflammation in the brain is try to look for this kind of microglial cell activation. And the way they do is try to measure um, this kind of protein called TSPO. It's a protein that is spreads in the outer membrane of the mitochondria and is part of transporting of the membrane for cholesterol. So this kind of uh, protein has been a, a function as a marker of a inflammation in the brain present in neurodegenerative diseases and inflammatory brain diseases. And in normal population, they have a low expression of these cells when you see inflammation, the, this, uh, a, this protein is in, expressed more and is a biomarker 
or glial cell activation. It's a marker of inflammatory responses in the brain, as in and a marker of the oxidative stress and mitochondrial homeostasis. We see here in the uh, represented in yellow is the mitochondria, and the mitochondria have a structure, a different structures, the outer membrane, the inner membrane, the intermembrane space, and in top of the intermembrane space, we have all the, the proteins to transport electron important for the synthesis of ATP. And here in between the two and the intermembrane space, this uh, compartment where all the metabolism of glucose occur and TSA, TCA cycle. So uh, when you use this kind of technique using a uh, uh, carbon 11, uh, um, tagging this protein called TSPO, they we're able to see things that we didn't see before in this pen MRIs. We see the contrast in the between normal patients into the left and healthy control. When they found out in, with use this technique, a lot of expression on T TSPO that correlate a lot of expression inflammatory response. Responses. In the left, you can see the difference with a highlight all the brain in patients with coronary fatigue compared with the healthy controls. But in addition, they found uptake in the uh, cervical area, in the neck, in the parotid gland. So the question is, is so many other areas have been inflamed? So these studies have been extended to the whole body and is able to uh, find the inflammation is not only in the brain, they found inflammation, like I see here in the spine of those patients, compared with the healthy control, there's no uptake. So, so this uh, kind of technique help us to uh, find out the inflammatory responses in patients with chronic fatigue is systemic, is uh, not only localized into the brain. This uh, another study looking at the second kind of technique, they're using carbon-11, try to tag uh, this protein called TSPO. Uh, this is a study from the Japanese group, uh, Nakatomi et al. Then found here into the left, we see inflammation, but a zone specific regions of the brain. And they found out in, in here in blue are the healthy control, in pink are people with chronic fatigue, when they found higher amount of tracer in patients with chronic fatigue compared with the control. And they found that some areas of the brain have been more affected than other ones. And they found a, a correlation between the severity of the symptoms with the amount of tracer. So it's a, a, a technique besides to tell us they are present or not, can tell about the degree of inflammation in those populations. When they're looking for the areas of the brain have been affected, it's not all the brain. They found in the midbrain, the pons, the thalamus, cingulate, amygdala, and hippocampus are the areas of the brain significant inflame in patients with chronic fatigue compared with the healthy controls. When you try to study what those regions do uh, in, in terms of functions, we see that it's a correlation between inflammatory responses and many of the things that we see in patients with chronic fatigue. Midbrain is more movement in the eyes, auditory and visual processing, pons, and the cortex is the transition between the cortex and cerebellum has to do when sleeping and dreaming. The thalamus is sen sensorial information, auditory, visual, tactile, gustatory. The hippocampus is part of the limbic system, has to do with a memory, short-term and long-term memory, and a special memory. So we see uh, the areas of the brain affected by inflammation can explain many of the symptoms or multiple symptoms that the person with chronic fatigue experience. The other way to look for inflammation is looking for the magnetic resonance spectroscopy, looking for brain metabolism. Then, like uh, they found elevations of the choline, lactic acid, magnositol, and increase the temperature in patients with chronic fatigue compared with the controls. And this, this kind of increase of this metabolism is indicator or microglial cell activation. In this study, they compared 15 females and 50 matching controls, and they found the levels of the inflammation is higher in this kind of population as well as the temperature. Here, in this kind of uh, images of the um, brain MRI, then we see in the control, the ratio between the two metabolites, choline and creatinine, was low, but in chronic fatigue patients, they found out this ratio is high. 
in this graph, you can see the control have a lower concentration of the inflammation, the activation of those metabolites compared with the patient with chronic fatigue syndrome. So in conclusion, we can say like a, 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 the brain has been affected and inflammation in patients with chronic fatigue. And this inflammation is not only in the brain has been shown in involvement or, or tissues like a, in the bone marrow of patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. So now let's talk about in long COVID. So the, the COVID virus is a, an RNA virus uh, with a, a, it's a very long virus with a 20 kilo basis. We have a four structural proteins, the spike proteins, envelope proteins, the beta membrane proteins, and nucleic acid proteins, and have been affected so far more than 6.9 million deaths and 677 infections. The, those people with a, a long COVID present with a more than 200 symptoms, and the symptoms can be closer in symptoms than a focus in the brain, in the lungs, in the circulatory system and immune system, similar than we see in patients with chronic fatigue, as well as evidence of dysbiosis and mitochondrial function. So the, but the definitions of long COVID is still evolving. Uh, the CDC defined long COVID as a patient to have symptoms after four weeks after the initial infections. The UK and the NICE, they divided oh, this uh, uh, condition in ongoing symptomatic COVID-19 symptoms that persist for four to 12 weeks and post-COVID or long COVID symptoms that persist longer than 12 weeks. The WHO defined long COVID as a people with symptoms more than three months since the initial infection, and the symptoms persist for at least greater than two months, and those symptoms cannot be explained by common conditions. And more recently, the recovery, they include symptoms to persist for longer than six months. So the criteria and definitions of long COVID are still in evolution, and uh, with the current knowledge, the evolution is going to take a different shape, hopefully, uh, very soon we have a more clear and defined illness. So I'm going to start to present a case and uh, how the people present and uh, how similar are those patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, JP is a 45 years old male. He's a, a physician, intervention cardiology, who works uh, for many long hours, covered multiple hospital. He is physically very active. He's a very good runner. He runs five minutes per mile. He likes skiing, cycle, and he likes to travel. He's married with one child and has no health issues, good eating and healthy habits, and no uh, take any medications. He's fully vaccinated and, and got the booster with mRNA vaccines. So on in November 2018, uh, to, to, in November 18, 2020, after being on call, he had a diffuse pain, diaphoretic, fatigue with a fever 101.9, and he decided to test himself, and he was positive for SARS-CoV-2 by PCR. He quarantined himself, but he developed very quarantine, some chunks of breath. His saturation came into 84. He went to the hospital, he checked his x-rays and pulmonary function tests, everything while within normal limits. He didn't receive oxygen. He was not hospitalized. He didn't get antivirus, but he was offered monoclonal antibodies. And the use of monoclonal antibodies, his wife believed that like his illness was stabilized. After two weeks of the quarantine, patient persists having some severe fatigue, brain fog, insomnia, a loss of sense of smell and taste, and diffuse body ache. His fatigue now over the time getting more constant. By the afternoon, the patient is completely exhausted. Uh, no resting doesn't help him to get him better. And his, his symptoms worse by physical activity, stress, and overstimulation. And the, the fatigue is linked with a brain fog. When he's more tired, his brain fog is worse. He experienced pain in the cervical spine, irradiated to his arm, and a weakness and numbness. He has a, a complete work negative, 
he was not able to uh, do any exercise or any or working. Lifting, so have difficult to lift activity, carry things, pushing, pulling, reaching overhead, and a problems with meal preparations. He had difficult to make some house chores and yard work, and his numbness, numbness in distal extremities uh, is getting worse. He have a skin biopsy, and the skin biopsy was a, suggested of a small fibrin neuropathy. His cervical MRI was show hypertrophy bone and narrow in C5 and C6. The patient continued with struggles, feel exhausted. His wife sometimes need to help him to get out of the car. In June 2020, he decided to stop working because his symptoms were incapacitated. His fatigue had been affecting his function. The brain force getting worse, having unrefreshed sleep having orthostatic intolerance, crash after activities. He has insomnia that is worse with the physical activities. He have a complete workout for x-rays, pulmonary function tests, MRIs, have been completely uh, negative. And they uh, was diagnosed with a possible hypothyroid, but the rest of the, no the labs are completely normal. He has been followed up by the PCP, neurologist, pulmonary, sleep medicine, and neurosurgery, and without any clinical, without any funders or answers to his questions. And in January 2024, he came to the clinic. When we see this kind of patient, it's very, very similar than our patient who's suffering chronic fatigue syndrome. So the, uh, normally in people with a long COVID or COVID infections, they over the time, they getting better. And this study done from in the UK, from with 26,000 patients, part of the UK coronavirus infection survey that uh, in this graphic represent in blue patients with a COVID diagnosed by PCR and in green are patients who had similar symptoms but the COVID test negative. You see in green, the patients after, and, and in here in the um, X, we have the weeks, 5, 8, 12, 16, and 19 weeks. And we see in green, the patients at five, week, at five weeks, only 2% have some symptoms. And over the time, very fast, the patients recover completely. However, in patients with a, a COVID infections, the illness over the time improved, in this case, from 11.4% of symptoms to 3% of symptoms at 12 weeks. But over the time, the symptoms disappear but remain plateau after 16 weeks. So in base of this kind of studies, we can conclude many of the people with a long COVID, with a COVID infections, they have some symptoms, but majority of the people respond, have been estimated like a one in 10, in 10 patients with a, a COVID infection develop long COVID symptoms. So during this kind of time, it's very important to uh, give some uh, support to the patients about the symptoms, just a, a way resting, uh, good eating habits, and because eventually the illness disappear. But however, in 10% of the population, they can get an infected, can persist the symptoms, and we call them COVID. So it's important to understand the, uh, patho the dynamics of the COVID infections in regular populations. In the initial, uh, early in the illness, we see the infection with a high predominant viral response. And over the time, five days later, the viral response start declining. But the follow this kind of viral declining, we see increase in the inflammatory responses. A study done in Mount Sinai with uh, 1,500 patients who had acute COVID and they mentioned in, uh, inflammatory cytokines, they found L6, L8, and TNF alpha are predictors of survivors in these populations. And the and this uh, uh, this another study looking for TGS beta, and this TGS beta cytokine that block the NK cell function, their cells are important to fight virus infections, and they found out high levels of TGS beta correlate with a poor outcomes and higher varemia. But the question is, what happened 
after the people pass the acute and subacute phase or inflammatory phase of uh, acute COVID in post-COVID symptoms. They are, uh, this area has been already, uh, more information is coming and have been found out uh, mitochondrial dysfunctions, amyloid depositions in those patients, systemic and local inflammation, disturbances in the immunological responses, hormonal imbalances, and virus persistent in this kind of population. Uh, but the question is, can we predict who develop long COVID or not? This study uh, from the UK, they uh, look at uh, patients who report having a COVID test positive by PCR and report symptoms. They found out uh, at a month after the symptoms, 13.3% based on persistent symptoms, uh, eight weeks, 45%, and 12 weeks, 2.3%. Uh, so, and they found out the symptoms to persist in this population were the fatigue, the headaches, dyspnea, and anosmia. And they found out this kind of group to high risk to develop this kind of persistent symptoms correlate with an old age, high BMIs, females, or people who have more than five symptoms at the time of the diagnosis or seven days after diagnosis of acute infections. In, in another study, they're looking about uh, what other factors can predict the development of long COVID. In this study, were 309 patients who have acute COVID, and they follow up over the time and see uh, which patient have persistent symptoms after uh, the uh, 28 days of the symptoms. They have shown questionnaires, the black collections, and they try to identify the same markers can predict the development of long COVID. And they found out if the patient has diabetes type 2, has a SARS-CoV-2, arinemia, EBB, varemia, or autoantibodies, those kind of uh, markers can predict the development of long COVID. But uh, so far, have been several hypotheses have been proposed for developing long COVID. One is the virus persistent, and there's evidence that the virus can persist in multiple organs, in the brain, in the muscles, in the gut, even after six months, 203 days after the initial infections. The gut has been proposed as a potential reservoir for this kind of virus, and, a, and have been shown the virus in pieces of the virus in the a gut ep epithelium. Mitochondrial dysfunction, the activations of the immune system, dysbiosis, so changes in the diversity in the microbiome, like I have been already reporting in current fatigue patients and long COVID, this lacking of diversity has been associated with bacteria that can lead into more inflammatory response, and the presence of minute microclads that can interfere with the blood flow in the small vessels and leave into hypoxia, and this can explain the symptom. This is how the, the theories have been proposed that uh, more recently are able to uh, identify a, a potential a, or changes in, in the body in people with a long COVID. Here in Stanford, we open our uh, long COVID clinic. We have now over a thousand patients, and we enroll patients who had age 18 years adults, adult population, who have a COVID test positive with symptoms of more than three days. And we had the data from the 150 patients enrolled between May 2021 to February 2022. And we see, again, the distribution is kind of mirror the distribution that we see in patients with a chronic fatigue presented recently by the CDC where age between 30 to 60 are the group more affected and lower in the strengths of the age, younger than uh, 20 and, and older than 80. They have a lower uh, prevalence of long COVID symptoms. The other thing with durations of the symptoms, people, the symptoms even persist for a, more than two or three years. Now, follow up, we see patients who have symptoms 
almost three or four years since the initial infection. So symptoms persist like we see in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. The uh, major risk factors of comorbidity we see, obesity, hypertension, chronic lung diseases as a most frequent comorbidity in the population with long COVID symptoms. And we see here the females have been affected around 60% of this population were females and possible the, uh, there are some hormonal factors that can influence the, of the why the female have been affected more. But studies have been shown that males, although have been less incidence of long COVID, have a higher chance to be hospitalized or higher chance of mortality. Obesity has been considered as a risk factor. I have been found out the COVID virus is able to replicate in adipocytes and cause inflammatory responses. And this can explain why maybe obesity as a risk factor to develop long COVID symptoms and more severe COVID infections. And we see in this kind of graphic, we represent all the symptoms that we see in patients from our clinic. And again, we see the fatigue, the poor cessation of malaise, brain fog, the unrefreshing sleep, and lethargy as the most common symptoms in this kind of population. So we decided to uh, investigate this problem better. And again, here we see the fatigue, portion malaise, brain fog, and infection sleep as the most common symptoms. Females have been affected more than males. And the symptom we see more common in females was the fatigue, the insomnia, and changes in the taste. So uh, we evaluate about how much those populations have been affected. We use the uh, functional status where one is patient has no symptoms and five patient completely incapacitated in bed. We found out around 30 to 40% of our patients in our clinic who present with long COVID symptoms are severe affected and incapacitated. So, uh, the question we need to figure out the any uh, clusters of patients can uh, separate the different kind of subgroups in patients with long COVID. So with this, this kind of analysis called principal component analysis with different kind of symptoms in our populations. And we find in this kind of circle uh, indicate the vector closer to the circles more frequently, the closer the symptoms together we call our clusters. So when we look at this analysis, we find out three major clusters, a cluster that include fatigue, position malaise, a brain fog and lethargy that correlate with the chronic fatigue syndrome or cluster what the gas intestinal light headedness that possibly imply the autonomy uh, cluster and there are another cluster with anomia and congestion. So we decided to investigate what is the prevalence of chronic fatigue syndrome in patients with long COVID. So in this study, we have a cohort of 105 patients who have symptoms for more than six months and, and we applied the IOMN criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome. And we found out majority of those populations were females. Most of the people, over 95% of the population, they are people prior healthy without any prior illness. They have been severe affected more in patients with chronic fatigue, like around 60%, 50% uh, of the patients with chronic fatigue have severe incapacitated versus around 25% uh, in patients without chronic fatigue syndrome. And we found out obesity is a very important risk factor for uh, severity of COVID or correlate with MECFS. So again, we see here the uh, female population more affected uh, than uh, and the around 43% of the population that we screen feed into the criteria for MECFS. So, so far we find similarity between MECFS and long COVID symptoms. One, they uh, precede an infection. In the long COVID patients, we have a coronavirus infections. And MECFS have been reported around 60% of the patients refer having a viral illness as an initial factor. When people study a coronavirus, over coronavirus, like a MERS and SARS, MERS in 2005, 
and SARS in 2012, people who recover for those infections, they end up having symptoms very similar than a, a long COVID. So possible coronavirus is one of the viruses can induce this kind of syndrome. The symptoms between MECFS uh, with compared with a long COVID MECFS have been similar. And sometimes in our clinic, we're able to differentiate the two populations. Females have been more affected. We have no um, biomarker, but we know in both conditions, persistent inflammation, neuroinflammation have been affected, have been demonstrated, and mitochondrial dysfunction have demonstrated in both conditions. So in our clinic, we try to expand our clinic. Now we are sending over 10,000 patients with a chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, we try to be more providers, try to uh, expedite the, how uh, soon we see those patients in the clinic. Um, the creation of the long COVID clinic make to expand our program and we are awarded for a NIS grant, try to uh, promote education to uh, the community and to healthcare providers to understand these kind of conditions and less to understand the dynamics and diagnosis of these kind of conditions. We are doing some projects to try to evaluate the cardiovascular problems, the sleep disorders, um, but the effect of vaccines in COVID, as well as the sensitivity to alcohol. We are going to study some uh, small vesicles, identify uh, potential biomarkers of this kind of illness, as well as looking for mitochondrial biomarkers. And uh, we are going to start soon uh, a trial, try to understand the processes of malaise in patients with um, uh, long COVID. And we are uh, developed, uh, participate in different uh, uh, treatment trials. We just complete a Pastrovi trial. The, the, the manuscript hopefully is going to be uh, submitted to public publications in the next couple of weeks. Um, the, I want to uh, just um, bring uh, uh, this kind of paper, I think, for me, it's a very important paper uh, published in January this month uh, in natural communication from the group from uh, uh, Amsterdam. And they're looking for muscle abnormalities uh, worsen after portions of malaise in patients with long COVID. As you know, the PM is the symptom that is very long mark in, in chronic fatigue syndrome. And we see PAM, PAM in over 80% of patients with long COVID. In this study, in, enrolled 25 patients with long COVID and 21 controls, matched by age, age and sex, who, and the control are people who have a, a COVID infection and a full recover. They collect blood and muscle biopsies. And before and after exercise, uh, both groups were healthy. Uh, social, very active, uh, have a, a, the COVID uh, was diagnosed based on a PCR and no participant was hospitalized due to COVID infections and fatigue questionnaires and the uh, data from the after exercise confirmed the impact of long COVID on daily lives. So people as a, develop long COVID symptoms. So in those patients, they found out in people with a, a long COVID they have low biomax, so the capability to uh, a absorb uh, oxygen decrease, the power peak is decreased, as well as the gas exchange, CO2 and oxygen have been lower in patients with long COVID. And imply like a, have been affected the um, muscle because it's happened changes after uh, physical activities. The other thing have been shown the muscle have been already, the structure have been changed. In the muscle, there are three different kind of fibers. And the one, a type one fibers, fiber than the pain of oxygen and the uh, mitochondrial function here in dark. In uh, gray are fibers 2X and 2A. There are some fibers than the pain or the glycogen metabolism, they are more anaerobic. If you see in the bottom line, the healthy control, they are more like a darker cells. Oh, I'm sorry. A darker cell that imply a lot aerobic metabolism and in patients with long COVID, this kind of a, a 
muscle fiber chains to uh, pale fibers than the pains of lacrimogen or anaerobic cells. So those patients, this study show already as abnormalities in the structure of the muscle cells in those patients with long COVID. The other thing is important looking for the meta mitochondrial function based on the uh, oxygen phosphorylation capacity. So the capability of the cells to make uh, energy. And they found out from the baseline in, in red are patients with long COVID, in white are people controlled. They found a lower amount the oxy the uh, oxygenation or oxygen transport electrons in the mitochondria in patients with chronic fatigue, with a long COVID, and when after exercise, those changes are more prominent. And the succinate, the hydrogenase, a marker for mitochondria mass, they found no difference in the baseline, but after exercise, decline in patients with a, a process with a long COVID that imply is a mitochondrial dysfunction as a factor or important in the explanations of processor malaise in these populations. The other thing, the theory about the um, amyloid depositions, they found in uh, healthy populations and people who recover with a, a long COVID, they have no amyloid deposition. The amyloid had been a, a bar here in this slide, like in a green color, where they have the position happening between the cells and around the vascular endothelium without any evidence of clotting or not in the lumen of the vessels that refute the proposed theory of like a micro clot as a possible etiology of this kind of problem. As well as they found out there's no association with the endothelial cells. We see in the uh, here in the graphic in the uh, B part in the B panel, the amyloid. Uh, uh, the positions content they found in the baseline patients with long COVID here in red have an amount of amyloid deposition and after exercise this amount increase. So baseline they have a high amyloid possible about a market of this kind of condition and this amyloid deposition increase with a physical activity. And something very interesting I want to mention here is the physical activity and the impact on the muscles. They found out in patients with a long COVID, they have a muscle atrophy. Here, big cells are regular muscle cells, and here, small cells are atrophic cells. And they found in patients with a, a long COVID symptoms a, who have experienced processor malaise have already muscle atrophy, and this atrophy changes increase with a physical activity. Important thing is the necrosis, damage of the muscles already have been demonstrated in those kind of patients, and this kind of damage increased by physical activity. So crashes or induced activity in those patients that lead into a crash can lead into damage or tissue damage, in this case, the muscles, as well as there are some evidence of muscle regeneration that imply past the nucleus of the cells in the middle of the muscles, as well as here, in the right uh, lower uh, quadrant panel, then you see a regeneration of the cells with a multinuclear cells and basophilic cytoplasm. So uh, the other changes in this study was mitochondrial dysfunctions that have been shown is a reduction of mitochondrial respiration and decrease in mitochondrial content in patient processes of malaise. And they have been associated with an increase in the production of free oxygen radicals or ROS. Uh, metabolites have been measured in this kind of patient and they look at metabolites in the muscles as well as in the, in the blood and they found the, the T cell cycle or T carboxylic acid uh, cycle have been decreased in patients with a long COVID, uh, uh, lower levels of creatinine and uh, this can contribute to explain why those people have a low oxidation for phosphorylation capacity or synthesis or ATP. And they have been shown changes in the lipid, in the biosynthesis of lipids and glycolysis have been reduced. And as well as uh, lower levels in metabolites that represent purines, pyrimidines, that's important for the, or represent a ATP synthesis. So uh, these studies uh, confirm uh, mitochondrial dysfunctions 
uh, metabolism abnormalities we decrease in the oxy oxy uh, oxy independent pathways TCA leading more into anaerobic pathways than include glycolysis. And the last things I want to say is uh, uh, in patients with a uh, long COVID and who has experienced PMM, PAM, they uh, experience a lot of inflammatory responses in the muscle. There are some uh, presence of T cells in those patients with long COVID before the patient develop uh, exercise like I'm in favor about activations in the immune system. Uh, viral proteins have been uh, show present in those patients. They're looking for nucleic acid proteins that represent virus different than the vaccine that represents spike proteins. And they found the nucleic acid proteins was present in both groups in healthy, healthy population and the controls. So in, uh, this doesn't show any active virus or this can explain the difference on this kind of condition. So this kind of uh, conclusion study of PAM is possible to have the same kind of findings, uh, it's possible to have the same kind of findings in patients with MECFS that uh, corroborate uh, skeletal muscle structure have been abnormal and in patients with a uh, long COVID and after exercise, they can lead to a muscle necrosis. And uh, this, uh, disturbances the local and systemic metabolic pathways and uh, the tissue infiltration with amyloid have been demonstrated in patients with long COVID and exercise can induce more deposition of these kind of factors. So I want to uh, uh, thanks for the invitations and and I want I open here for any questions that you may have. One of the questions uh, in, in the uh, bus address was uh, uh, any uh, therapeutics. Uh, at this point, we don't have uh, no drugs approved by the ADA for the treatment of these kind of conditions. And whatever drugs that we have is the use is, uh, is off-label therapies. Um, a therapy that has shown possible benefit need to be studied by the uh, of recovery. Uh, hopefully, uh, other groups can be interested to explore different kind of uh, therapies. Uh, something like uh, this work for those patients is uh, pace is very important. Possible uh, dietary changes may help to control the uh, problems, but still uh, this area need to be uh, support more to do more clinical trials. Um, other questions about is uh, the long COVID symptoms can affect uh, narcolepsy. So uh, we are studying um, the uh, anor uh, sleep abnormalities in patients with long COVID. So hopefully maybe in two or three months, we have more answers try to give more information. We see those patients present with insomnia or sometimes uh, hyperinsomnia, interrupted sleep, and unrefreshing sleep. Uh, this area is still in research and they need to be clarified more. About the Paslovy trial results, the study have been concluded. The manuscript has been already uh, close to be final and we are hopefully maybe to submit in a couple of weeks and we, as after the submission, we can share with you the results of this study. Thank you, Dr. Bernia, um, for sharing this very fascinating information. And I want to thank um, everyone who joined us this evening. Uh, if you'd like additional information or resources, Amy has posted um, the contact, our email for Stanford Health Library. And we hope that you can join us for uh, our lecture next week on adult vaccinations. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.